Good morning, Redlands and Sure Hope. Everybody who's joining us, it's great to be meeting this morning. Uh, if you're just settling in, why don't you grab that cup of tea, maybe reposition the kids who might be moving uh, around in front of the television. Get comfortable because it is great this morning to be able to gather around God's word, to uh, hear him speak to us, to respond in prayer and thanksgiving. And if you're new, particularly if this is your first time joining us online, good to have you with us. Uh, my name's Josh. I'm the senior minister here. And I've got Chris with us. Good to see you, Chris. G'day, Josh. G'day, everyone. Nice to be here. Chris is going to be preaching for us a little bit later on. Um, but if you are new, if this is your first time, why don't you let yourself, uh, why don't you say hello? Maybe just say, I'm new in the comments section, whether you're watching on YouTube or at online.redlands or online.shorehope. We would love to, to get to know you uh, and to answer any questions you might have. Today, uh, Chris, you're going to be um, preaching to us about one of the key pictures of church, which is the picture of the body and... Um, the oh, temple. Sorry, the temple. Don't Next get too week. Yeah. Next <laughs> week is the body, um, the temple or the building. And so um, we're just going to be giving some thought to what church is and what do we do uh, when we gather? What is it, what's significant about that? And I, I, I want to begin by just talking about um, or, or hearing about uh, the great gathering that the Apostle John saw uh, in his vision in the book of Revelation. What we see is there's a throne. On the throne is a lamb looking as though it's slain. We know that's the Lord Jesus. Um, and there is this great gathering of people. And this is the final point in that picture. It says in, in chapter 5, verse 13, then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and is all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and glory and honour and power forever and ever. And so there is a very real sense in which our gathering today online is a signpost that points us to this great heavenly gathering uh, that we will experience around Jesus uh, when he returns, uh, that all those who trust him, who put their faith in him, will uh, enjoy that experience in beholding him and worshipping him together. And so what we do, even though it is different, it is online at the moment, what we do uh, is significant for that reason. Um, we're going to now spend some time uh, singing together uh, in song, and the first song we're going to be singing is this, I believe. It's the creed. It is the, the confession of the church through the ages. So let's sing this together. Thank you. 
Well, thanks so much for that, uh, Simon and Jeff and Renee. Uh, we're going to have an interview now where we hear from uh, Elizabeth, who uh, works at, uh, for the church. She works in the office. Uh, she does a great job uh, for us, but she's also uh, got a lot to share in the way of how, I guess, things with the way we've done church have changed, but also what they're going to look like going forward. So thanks, Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. Hey, Josh. How are you going? I'm doing well, thank you. Good. Um, welcome to our kind of online church interviews. Um, for, for those who don't know, you actually play a pretty um, key role in our church uh, staff team. You kind of keep the administrative wheels greased uh, and you look after communication and stuff. Um, and it's been a very different time for you, this COVID period. So what's, what's changed in your role over the last three months? All right. So when COVID first hit and we were closed down, my work level kind of went to zero. It was just such a different time. I was really busy before and then there was nothing. Um, and it was a frustrating time for me because my job is to support you and Russ and the other ministry people um, to make your work easier. And I knew you were working really hard and I couldn't support you. It was and just, it, yeah. It was it one was of those just, really crazy times, wasn't it? It was, it was really frustrating for me. Yes. Knowing that you were flat out and I couldn't help. But anyway, um, after a couple of weeks, you guys started to settle into how it was going to be. And then the work started filtering through. And let's just say work's picked up. I'm, yeah. I'm quite busy now. So, yes. um, yeah. Um, and so what's been challenging and encouraging about that? Challenging, that's easy. Technology, I had to, I had to learn on the run. Um, there were things I, Steve would attest to that I had a few panic moments going, I just don't know how to do this technology stuff. But I eventually picked up things. I've picked up some useful skills. So that's um, good. Um, yeah. And learning um, how to work through this and showing love to everybody in all mm. their different situations in life. Um, that's been challenging, but um, good to do. Um, and also searching out the guidelines that are relative to us as a church, um, the guidelines from the government and understanding them and then interpreting them for us. That's been quite challenging. Um, and a great encouragement to me has been the way uh, we've got a group of people who, uh, well, go back, we've got people who um, don't have the technology to be able to catch up with our services online. And so we've been producing DVDs and CDs for those people. And I've got a band of people who so graciously and willingly and enthusiastically deliver to those people each week. And and they just, they love it. So, Absolutely, and yeah. and the people who receive the DVDs, are, they're overwhelmed um, uh, that we would do it for them. So, yeah. I'm really grateful to those people who Absolutely. Deliver. No, yeah. that, they've been fantastic. They have. Yeah. And so, kind of like, um, this is the way we've been doing things in terms of our online services. And now we're talking about restarting our public gatherings, um, which is very exciting. Uh, and you've been doing lots of the work, as you've said, in terms of getting across government guidelines. Um, can you just share a couple of things that are going to be different when we return? To our, our old normal, to our new normal. That's We're trying it. to make it as least bumpy as possible um, for everyone and make it not too different. But there's going to be sig some significant changes. Yes. Um, Obviously, seating will be really different. We'll have only enough seating in the church for the number of people we can take. Yep. Um, there'll be 100 people allowed in the building total. So that has taken some figuring out. There'll be strict entry places and exit places. Obviously, there'll be hand sanitizer or you've got to wash your hands well. We will be also taking um, uh, attendance records. Yes. as that's part of the government requirements that we know who has been in, the, uh, in our building at all times. Yeah, so, so that's if, if anybody was to get sick, 
which God willing, we hope doesn't happen. But if they did, there's a record of who would have been in the building when they were. Yes, that's, that's right. So yeah. that's something that's going to be really unusual for people, yeah. but it has to happen. We'll have people with fancy little apps on their phones, counting people in and out of the church. Um, the sad thing, we won't be able to have morning and tea, morning tea and supper, at least initially. Yeah. Um, I know people enjoy that, but we won't yep. be able to have it. Um, there'll also be different smells. We are cleaning <laughs> this place and it's going to smell different. Yeah. Fresh. Fresh, that's right. Fresh. Glen 20. Glen 20. Here we come. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there's ways we could describe it, we'll, but we'll just stick with fresh at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously, the no hugs, kisses, handshakes. And there'll be other bits and pieces along the way. So um, that that will be different. And one of those is that kids will go straight into the hall for kids' church and not yes. come to the church. Yeah. So that'll be really different. Yeah. So, so there just is lots of different things. It's kind of not going back to the way things were, but going forward to something new. Yeah. Um, um, what, what gets you excited about it? Like, obviously, there's lots of challenges, but what, what are you yeah. excited about? Oh, it'll be great to get back together again, won't it? Yeah. And see more than just a few faces on a screen. That's I'm looking forward to that. While it will be different and they they may not be singing for a while, yeah, uh, it will be good to have be able to chat with people because um, it's so different on a screen. Um, so I'm looking to forward to no more Zoom meetings and and church um, online. But it is also great. I think what's exciting is that we can reach more people now mm. because we've practiced going yes. online. Yep. We can do in person and online. So yep. that's we right. can reach, reach more people that way. Yeah. That's exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And that's something that particularly when we come, when we restart, for those who, who don't feel that they can't, can uh, join the services when we restart just yet, there still will be a live stream that we'll have up. Mm, so, yeah. yeah. So thank you for your time, uh, Elizabeth. Appreciate it. No problem. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to spend some time praying. Um, we're going to particularly say thank you to God for all the ways people have served during lockdown. Say thank you for, for people like Elizabeth, but also those she mentioned who have just done so many things uh, to care for and look after others. Uh, but also we really want you to pray yeah, at home for God's help as we relaunch our services. So why don't you take a few minutes with those around you uh, to pray. Uh, I'll be back soon.
Well, let me uh, just uh, wrap up. Mighty God, Lord, we praise and give thanks to you uh, that through this season where we haven't been able to meet physically, uh, we thank you that we've been able to meet online and we've been able to gather around your word. Um, we thank you for all those people who've enabled that to happen. We thank you for people like Elizabeth um, and all those who are working in our um, ministry team. Father, we also thank you for all the volunteers who have done such a wonderful job in serving and loving our congregations. Heavenly Father, we, we look forward, though, to being able to meet back in person. There is much to do, um, and yet we ask uh, that you would give us the energy and the strength and the wisdom uh, and the, the longing to do that. Um, and we pray this for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Well, uh, we're going to again be singing, and this song is a hymn about the church. Uh, it is a wonderful hymn that actually describes the way that the church isn't just a gathering of people, but is built upon the foundation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and so we're going to sing that now. Well, the church, church's foundation is built upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's in him and him alone that we can know God uh, and that we can call him our Father. And because of that, we're able to bring our prayers before him 
And we're going to do that now. Simon Kennedy from Sure Hope is going to be praying for us. So let's do that together now. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's pray together. Our loving and heavenly Father, we are grateful that we can gather uh, as uh, a congregation before you today. We're grateful that we can gather in homes and uh, we can gather in other places as well. Even if it is virtually, Lord, uh, we are grateful that we can still do this and share this time together, worshipping you uh, on your day. And we ask, Lord, that you continue to bless us as we do this. Our Father, uh, as we uh, thank you for this, we um, are aware of our sins and we pray that you would please forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness in the name of Jesus. Thank you. We can come to you uh, with confidence, knowing that uh, that you will forgive us um, if we come to you in his name. Grateful for your son, Jesus Christ, for his uh, life and death and resurrection and his ascension to your right hand. And we ask that we would all continue to live our lives in light of this glorious truth. Our Lord, as we uh, as we are thankful that we can do what we're doing uh, this morning, we pray that you would please prepare us and prepare our church well to um, to begin gathering again in person. It's something we greatly look forward to, and we all miss doing it. And so we ask, Lord, that you would uh, help our staff team, particularly Josh and Russell, as they are strategically plan for this. We ask for many volunteers uh, that would be able to carry the burden of uh, the requirements uh, of us get gathering together again. Uh, we pray for wisdom for those who are making decisions on session and in the staff team, uh, that they would be driven by a love for your people and a respect for those in authority over us. Um, as we, as we uh, do this, we pray for those in authority over us, uh, for our civil governments, that you would please uh, Bless us with good government. Uh, may they um, reward righteousness and good, and may they punish evil. Uh, and as we move toward a election here in Queensland, we pray that your will be done. As we look around the world and see much political unrest, we ask that you would please help us to trust you and trust that Jesus is king on the throne, uh, regardless of uh, who is on the throne here on earth. Uh, so, so, Lord, give us um, give us trust in you and Help us to um, yeah to honour those in authority, whoever they are. Our Lord, we pray for uh, our denominational aged care, for press care, and uh, we ask Lord for the staff and residents as decisions are being made and as deliberations are being made over the future of that inst these institutions and of that organisation that you would please give them stability, uh, even at this time, uh, that you might. Uh, guide the negotiations over the future of press care. And we pray for wisdom uh, that uh, those who are leading this organisation and those who are involved in the negotiations would act in a God-honouring way and think well about what they have to do. And Lord, we lift up to you those who are suffering in our uh, congregations. Uh, we ask uh, that you would please help those uh, who have lost loved ones in particular, that they will know the peace which passes all understanding that can only come from you. We pray for those who are unwell, uh, that they will be supported. Uh, we thank you for the medical professions and the medical professionals that we enjoy in this country. Uh, we pray that you would give them wisdom and that you would heal people if it is your will through their hands or if you have some other miraculous way of healing uh, those who are unwell, that you would do that. But through all this suffering, God, we pray that you would please sharpen your people and... Uh, make them more like Christ in this. Our Lord, we ask uh, uh, that you would hear our prayer and we have confidence that you will hear our prayer uh, because we pray it in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Thanks, Simon. Uh, well, as I said, we're, we're going to be looking at uh, the church this morning and one of the great books in the Bible that explains, I guess, the, the, the first stages of the church, the, the explosion of the church after uh, Jesus was ascended into heaven, um, is the book of Acts. And uh, we and our friends at QuizWorks have put together some, some um, kids' videos on the book of Acts. And so they're going to be doing our kids' talk this morning. 
if you want to take this moment while the kids are watching it to get the, the activity sheets that go with the video, uh, you can jump onto my.redlands.org.au or my.surehope.church and they should be there. Hi everyone, I'm Matt and welcome back to QuizWorks Home Delivery. And today, today is very exciting because today we're going to begin looking at an awesome book of the Bible, the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, we're going to see again and again that the mission of the risen King Jesus cannot be stopped. And because we're going to learn that uh, so many times, we're going to do it together. Okay, so see if you can do it with me. The mission of the risen King Jesus cannot be stopped. Freeze or I'll shoot. Well, Scruff, what are you doing? I'm not Scruff. I'm Agent Scruff. 007? Agent Scruff 007? That's right. And I said, freeze or I'll shoot. Right. And how are you going to shoot me with Cedric? I have my ways. Look, just give him to me. Oi! Thank you. What? what? How, how, how did you... How, how did you do that? I have my ways. Now... What were you doing with Cedric? Well, I heard that you were talking about a mission. Uh, so I wanted to go on my own mission. Right, and what mission was that? To make the biggest and bestest chalk-coated bow in the whole wide world. <sighs> right, a anyway, today as we begin our look at the book of Acts, we're going to see that Jesus has a much bigger and bigger better mission than some chalk-coated bone. The biggest and bestest chalk-coated bone in the whole wide world. Jesus' mission is that people from all around the world would hear that Jesus is the king. And Jesus' mission is that people from all around the world would accept Jesus as their king. It seems way too big. It seems impossible. Well, it may seem impossible. But as we look through the book of Acts, we're going to see that, do it with me, the mission of the risen King Jesus cannot be stopped. But surely something could get in the way. Surely something could stop it. Oh no, it, it can't be stopped because this was God's plan. This was God's mission from the very beginning. Really? Really. Because cause look, the book of Acts, it starts, it starts quite a long way through the Bible. Lots of stuff has happened before we get to this point. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to watch a quick animation which helps us see how we get to here. Let's watch. The mission of the risen King Jesus begins from before time began and it goes till the end. In the beginning it was clear to see that God was the King because he's the one who created and rules everything. All things in the sky and the sea and the ground, the plants and the animals with each unique sound. Then God created people, both large and both small. It was clear to see that God was the king over all. But people thought, this doesn't seem to be right. Why should God rule us? Let's put up a fight. And so to the king people said, Go away! We'll rule ourselves from now on, from this very day! But ignoring the king led people to fight with each other. And the world God had made, it was now in a bother. When people started ruling themselves, it made God quite sad. His good creation and people had turned out quite bad. But God didn't say, Well, you reap what you sow. Instead, he made a great promise that his love he would show. God promised a king who would bring people back. He'd always be perfect. He'd stay right on track. This king would bring healing from sickness and disease, but not all would like him or bow on bended knees. After God's promise, kings would come and they'd go, but each one would fail. They'd be a no-show. Till one day, an angel appeared to a lady. Mary, he said, you'll soon have a baby. This baby will be the king God had promised. 
Through his life and his death, he'll take the curse far from us. So Jesus, he came and he showed one and all that he was the true king promised of old. He healed the sick and the crippled, the weak and the lame. And his love and his teaching, it brought him great fame. But just like before, people said, This ain't right. I don't want God's king to rule us. Let's put up a fight. And so Jesus the king, they killed on a tree. He died there for you, and he died there for me. So it seemed that the mission would not come to pass, because God's true king, he was meant to last. But just as God promised, so it came to be, Jesus rose back to life. Oh yes, yippee! So Jesus, he showed that the true king he was, and he gave his 11 friends a mission starting with, because, because I'm the risen king for all eternity, you must now go and tell all people of me. Go near and go far and throughout the whole world. Tell each man and woman, tell each boy and girl. When the Holy Spirit comes, you must go. Tell people to the risen King Jesus, you all must bow. Though people may try and stop it and tell you to flee, Jesus' mission's unstoppable, as we shall all see. The Bible tells us that from before the creation of the world, God's plan was that Jesus would be the king, even though people try to stop it. Exactly. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus tells his followers this. He says, But the Holy Spirit will come upon you and give you power. Then you will tell everyone about me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and everywhere in the world. In other words, Jesus gives his followers a mission. And that mission is that people from all around the world would hear that Jesus is the king. And Jesus' mission is that people from all around the world would accept Jesus as their king. And you reckon nothing can, can stop this mission? That's what the book of Acts tells us. Okay, cool, but well, I think my mission still sounds pretty cool too. Yeah, I guess so. But I can't do it without Cedric. Look, I'll, I'll send him back to you in another home delivery. No, it's okay. I'm going to try to find that trapdoor in the camera that, that, that you used. And, and then be careful. And no, it's, it's a... ah! <sighs> Over the coming weeks in Quizworks Home Delivery, uh, my friends and I will, will help us keep looking through the book of Acts together. And we will keep seeing again and again that, one last time, the mission of the risen King Jesus cannot be stopped. Uh, if you've already signed up at www.quizworks.com slash home delivery, you will find some awesome ideas that can help you and your family be on that mission with Jesus. See you soon. Today's reading is Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near, for through him we have both, sorry, for in him, for through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together, and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord, and in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. This ain't a song for the brokenhearted. No silent prayer for the faith departed. I ain't going to be just a face in the crowd. You're going to hear my voice when I shout it out loud. Whoa, whoa. It's my life. Uh, if Bon Jovi, if he's known for one song, at least in my head, it's this one. Like Frank Sinatra before him, Bon Jovi, he wants to be known for just one thing. He does life his own way. Some people have mantras, some people have sayings to sum up their lives, and Bon Jovi, he's got a song. I wonder what the central statement for you would be about your life. See, one of the more confronting places that we see this, uh, I see this stuff, is if you, when you see a headstone for a grave, Headstones, they often sum the life of the person, don't they? Uh, Merv Griffin, he wrote his shortly before he died. Uh, he said, I won't be right back. Now, for the younger crowd amongst us, Merv was a, a famous talk show host in the States, and he wanted to be remembered for this. This was his claim to fame. Maybe, maybe for you, you're not like Merv. Maybe you more identify with someone like Kay. Let me show you hers. Two squares of chocolate, two tablespoons of butter, the list goes on. You see, Kay's claim to fame is her humour. It's, uh, it's her, and also her famous fudge. You see, as we study the book of Ephesians over the next couple of weeks, that's the question we're asking together. What is the church's claim to fame? Simon, he's going to help us next week thinking about the church as a body. But this week, we're looking at this idea of church as temple. As we plan to come back together uh, to doing church in person, it's fitting that we think about what it is that we're restarting, isn't it? What are we restarting? What's, what's our claim to fame? You see, if, if Redlands Prezi was a person and we killed over tomorrow, what would be the essence of our life? What, what makes us a church? Have a, have a think for just a moment. I'll give, you, I'll give you 10 seconds. Have a think. What goes on our, on our headstone? Just have 10 seconds. Okay, 10 seconds, that's it. Well, you'll, you'll be relieved to know that, that Paul's actually going to help the Ephesians and us answer something like that today as well. And he does this by asking us to do one action together. One action. He, he wants the Ephesians to remember, to remember together. And they're remembering three things. Three things to remember. They are remember who they were, remember who their God is, and finally, they're to remember who they are in God. I'm going to pray for us and ask for God's help as we seek to understand his word together. So let me pray and pray with me. Father, thanks that your word is clear, uh, that you have 
uh, given it is in the Lord Jesus. And we pray that we would hear you speak today. Make us remember well uh, these things we seek to hear Paul say. And we pray that you would make us into a church um, that is honouring to you and worthy of your name. Amen. So first, uh, we're remembering who we were, who the Ephesians were. And Paul, he lays it out for us in verses 1 to 3. So grab your Bible. We're going to work through the text together. Uh, Verse 1 to 3. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, and you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were deserving of wrath. You see, he starts by telling the Ephesians that uh, you were once not God's people. Verse 1, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And now there's two ways that Paul describes this deadness and sins. First, he says it's a description of your allegiance. Their allegiance, it's not to God, did you notice? It's to the kingdom of the air. Paul says that when you don't belong to God, you actually belong to Satan. Now that's a big claim. How, how does Paul know this? Well, it's, it's there in the passage. It's there in his second descriptor. And it's a bleak picture. Paul says you can be sure of this because of what your former life looked like. Gratifying the cravings of the flesh, uh, whatever a thought or desire we have, we just follow it. He said the Bible gives this picture of, of sin across it, that it's, it's this subhuman thing. It's more like the behavior of animals and less like what God intends for his people. And if you think about that just for a moment now, animals, they, they don't put too much thought into restraining their desires, do they? Uh, I used to have a dog, a little, a little Jack Russell. Um, he was probably about that big. Uh, and his name was Dusty. Dusty. Dusty loved to eat. He loved food. And we used to joke in our family that if we gave him one of those self-feeders that the birds and, and uh, hamsters have, that he'd probably explode because he would just do nothing else uh, we used to keep his food on this freezer just above his bed. And one night, uh, I don't know how it happened, but the, the bag of food fell off the, off the top of the freezer and broke open on the floor. And we came down in the morning and we found a very sorry state for a dog. Bloated and round and sprawled out on his back. He'd smashed through at least half that bag. And he was, he was a small dog. And you could see on the look on his face that he was in pain. <laughs> But, but he would do it all over again. Now, he was a great dog. He was a fun dog. But there's a limit to the, the sort of relationship that I can have, uh, even with an animal like that, isn't there? We, people just aren't in the same category. It's a little bit like the picture that Paul paints here in Ephesians. He says, remember, you were like animals, following your desires instead of following God. You see, because of sin... Their relationship with God was cut off. We resisted his rule for our lives and and made ourselves his enemies. Paul says we're deserving of wrath. And as we stroll further and further away from God into sin, this is what the Bible says happens. You see, remembering, remembering is a critical place to start for us this morning as we think about temple, remembering who we were specifically. Paul says you were strangers, aliens, cut off from God. And, and that's a really big problem. It's a really big problem. It's a no-brainer, but it's a big problem as we consider the second thing that he asks us to remember. The second thing he says is, remember who our God is. Because temple, it represents three things across the Bible. It represents this manifest presence of God, his glory among his people. That's one. It represents a place where sin can be atoned for, where sacrifice can be made, number two. And number three, it's where God is revealed to his people. It's presence, atonement, it's revelation. And it's a problem for us as sinners because God is holy. That's the second thing we're remembering. It's the second side of the coin for us this morning. And let me show you a couple of these things in Israel's story. It's a place we can see this really clearly. Um, I'll sketch a few pictures of the Bible here. So that their story, it begins in the Garden of Eden in Genesis. God, he creates Adam and Eve, and they're walking and talking together. There's, there's distinction between them. There's, there's creator and there's man, but there's no barrier. 
they're walking and they're talking. That's until sin, until sin enters the picture and Adam and Eve choose to follow their desires and reject God. Their relationship with each other is broken, but, but more notably here, their relationship with God is broken. And so full of sin and shame, when God comes looking for them, they hide. They no longer belong with God. He casts them out of the garden. You see, God's, God's holiness means that he must judge sin. Uh, they cannot mix like petrol and a flame. And, and as we journey through Israel's story more, we only see sin bloom more. Because of our, our sin, relating to God, becomes, it becomes complex. But God, in his mercy, he, he determinedly forges this relationship with his people Israel. He, he promises to them that he'll, that he'll be their God. He promises that the whole world is going to be blessed through them. And he even gives them this land that they can dwell together in God and his people. But sin continues to lurk. Sin, this toxic barrier between, becomes, becomes between them. So the tension in the Bible is how can a holy God dwell among sinners? Well, he gives these careful instructions in the first few books of the Old Testament about this place where they can meet, where God will manifest his glory among them. They can come to, come to know him and they can have their sins atoned for. You see, God, he chooses this temple building among his people, this place where he's going to dwell. But the problem of sin is still there. It's still there. Whether you're part of the rebel Israelites that are swallowed up by fire at the temple entrance in number 16, or even if you're Moses, Moses is Israel's mediator, all are barred from God's presence by sin. Let me have a quick excursion with me in Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. I'll read it for us. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, just the temple, and Moses could not enter the tent because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. You see, Israel's story here, it tells us, it tells us of the danger of taking God's holiness lightly. It tells us the danger of taking our sin lightly. Because God's temple, it's the place that he chooses to manifest his glory, to reveal himself to his people. It's the place they can go to atone for their sins. But if you approach him lightly, there is no more dangerous place for a sinner. It's, it's a bit like the, the precautions I'm told we take in, in constructing nuclear reactors. I'm not a nuclear physicist, so this could be really dodgy. But I'm told there's, there's special measures, measures that we need to take. Uh, the uranium rods, they need to sit in just the right kind of water and the depth to control the temperature. They need to be contained in concrete or lead and, and approach for a very short space of time under the right kind of protocols for the engineers for danger for them. Because of sin, God hands Israel the nuclear reactor guide for dummies of relating to him so that they can enjoy the blessing of knowing him intimately as he made them for. But sadly, Israel's story, it, it continues in this, in this poor trajectory. They become so corrupt that the nations that, that are supposed to stream to them because they've got the temple, those nations instead see Israel and they start to mock God for choosing them. They mock his holiness until finally God's patience, it reaches its end over a couple of thousand years. Uh, in the book of Ezekiel, it's, it's, a, it's like a sad ending to a sitcom. God, he, he pauses at the threshold of the temple and looks back and he flicks the lights off as he heads out. Israel, they're left without a temple. They have no manifest presence of God there. The building, it just becomes this empty rain shelter. You see, the story of Israel, it points out for us so clearly what Paul means to establish here at the beginning of Ephesians 2. He says, remember, this is who you were. This is who you were, deep in sin, unable to draw close to God as you were made to. A God who is unfathomably holy. Temple, in this circumstance, it seems impossible, doesn't it? And it's because of Israel's weakness that the idea of God dwelling among people it just seems like pie in the sky. But with one word, Paul tells us that the game has changed. In our chapter today, he tells us that sin is not the end by encouraging them to remember one more thing. Paul says, in verse, Paul says but, in verse 10, he says, but remember 
Who you were is not who you are. Remember who you are in God. That's the third thing we're going to look at together. And this change, it comes about for one reason. It's not because the Ephesians are any less sinful than Israel were. It says, Paul says in verse 4, it's because God's love steps in. It's because he's rich in mercy. He brings the ultimate temple to his people in the Lord Jesus. You see, he, Jesus, he is the place where God's glory is manifest, and it's manifest in human form. It's where this clear revelation of God happens. He speaks a language that they can understand through Jesus' words. And it's the place that sin can be perfectly and fully atoned for in his perfect blood. You see, Christ's death, it undoes the curse of sin. Yet relationships with each other, they're somewhat mended, but it's a relationship with God that is opened. When Jesus, he dies on the cross, it's no coincidence here that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all record for us that when he dies, a temple curtain is torn in two from top to bottom. This, this big, heavy curtain that separates the most inner sanctum of where God's presence is symbolized to dwell, it's torn because the barrier of sin is torn. The divide between God and his people, God has done away with it. Instead of hostility between man and God, there's now peace because of this perfect temple, Jesus. Have a look. Let me show you. Verse 14, we'll read together. For he himself is our peace, who, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law when its commandments and regu- with, with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create for himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. You see, Jesus, he's the ultimate temple because he's the clearest revelation of God to man. He comes as one of us. He comes in a form that we can see, that we can hear speak, that we can touch. He's the most effective atonement for sins because he is without sin himself. He's the perfect sacrifice. And he's the ultimate manifestation of God's glory at the cross because he is both man and God. You see, Jesus, he calls the cross when he's raised up before everyone. He says, this is my hour of glory. He's raised up before all the nations and they're to come to him as they were supposed to come to Israel's temple in Micah 4. You see, those who are far off, foreigners, strangers, are brought near in him. Humanity that was cut off at the garden from God are given access to the Father that only the perfect Son has. They have access to the Father now by the Spirit through faith in Christ. They're brought into the very essence of God. You see, there's, there's now one united people, one united people in Christ, and this is what we call the church. Paul, he calls it the household of God, and it's built, it grows on the foundation of Christ. Have a look. It's, it's in verse 20 there. I'll read for us again. God calls these guys members of his household. So members of his household, end of verse 19, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building joined together and joined, is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. See, Christ, he's the means of establishing the temple, but he's also the temple itself, it says here. And Paul, he says that the church, it's built on Jesus. He's the one that joins the building together, and he also is the one that shapes the building to look more like him. He dwells in it. Did you notice that this isn't a building of bricks and mortar? It's a building of God's people. If you are in Christ, Paul says, God is in you. He has joined you to the ultimate temple, to the ultimate dwelling place in himself. He's joined you to Christ, his son. You see, the book of Revelation, it, it describes this new city where God, that God builds to dwell with his church forever. But it has no temple. It has no temple. There's no building. It's just God and his people. The divide between heaven and earth, it's gone. 
as the divide between man and his creator is gone, they know each other intimately. See, the intimacy between God and his church, it's not a return to Eden. It's actually something far better. It's far better because this can't be lost. We move from the good of Eden, the bad of Israel's story, to actually something far better in Jesus. And it's secure in him, not in the failing of our story. The the church, it's the embryonic form of what God intends for his people forever. The gathering of those people who will praise and enjoy God forever. There's no temple in heaven because God dwells intimately with his people. We know him face to face. We behold his glory together forever. Now, that's something to look forward to, isn't it? I hope, you feel, I hope you feel like it is. But especially more so as we plan to come back together and do church in a closer proximity. It's, it's a place for those who know Jesus, but it's also a place for those who are getting to know Jesus. We gather as those who were to be those who are in Jesus. We gather as God's church by faith as the place that he dwells. In Christ, there is no longer any need to hide from God as Adam and Eve did because the shame of our sins is done away with. Instead, God actually comes to you. With Christ in eternity, you'll never not belong. You will always belong. You see, we've been through a really strange time, haven't we, with church recently? Gathering online, like I think in those first few weeks, I really felt it, and I've still been wondering it, but you sort of have that irking feeling of, is this really church? It feels so different. It feels like there's something missing, doesn't it? And I, I want to say there's, there's a sense of comfort for us here, because although this feels really different, your merit of belonging for God is not in your ability to gather. It's built on gathering in Christ by faith. Christ is our foundation, not this building. You've not been taken from Christ during COVID. But it's possible that, uh, it's, it's likely that you felt, still felt some sense of coldness in this expression of church. And I think there's a really good reason for that. There's a really good reason for that. In fact, if, if they feel like there's nothing missing or that your life hasn't changed or that church is just another club like the gym starting up, then maybe this is worth you hearing as well. You see, church... It's the expression today of God's temple. We gather around God's word to hear him speak, to hear the, of this, this ultimate atonement in Jesus, sins ultimately forgiven in the gospel. We gather as part of this expression of his presence together. But God, now God is present in the whole world, yes. like The, the Bible says that uh, heaven and earth, neither of those can contain him. But if he's chosen to dwell among his church... He's present as we gather in a, in a rather special way. There's a significance as we gather as God's temple. From the moment that God makes man in the garden, he makes us together. Together to glorify and enjoy him forever. To proclaim his rule over the world forever. He makes us as a people for him. It's possible as we return together that you could be feeling really anxious or afraid. Church in Australia or here in Redlands, it's not what it once was. And, and these emotions, anxiety and fear, they can send us in all kinds of directions. But we've heard today that there's actually just one direction for the church. There's one people, a new humanity in Jesus. He promises to build his church. He's been building his church all through time. And that doesn't stop because our circumstances become a little strange. You can rest assured in his ability to build his church. Because the temple, friends, it's, it's not a building. It's not a building. It's not even the people on their own merit. It's the dwelling place of God in Christ. And the people, we're grafted into him. So we join in this temple. We're built into him. But he chooses to dwell among his people. That's the church, his household. The church is the people of God, and he chooses to dwell with them. All these people from all nations, all tongues, gathering together now as they will in the course of eternity to glorify God and enjoy him forever, the blessing of knowing him rightly. 
And we wait. We wait for his return now, proclaiming this good news that God's temple is actually open. It's open. As we gather as church, uh, we gather in Christ, as we will on that last day, all the nations standing before his throne. You see, if Redlands Prezi, if we killed over tomorrow, I'd hope the sum of our life is something like in Christ. You are no longer who you were, cut off from a holy God, but instead, he is with you, and you are with him forever. Let's pray together and thank God that this is true and this is for us. Father, thanks so much that uh, your mercy and your love break through. You made us for a relationship with you, and despite our sin, you have chosen to continue to build your church. Thanks that in the Lord Jesus you have overcome our sin, that he is the ultimate expression of your presence, atonement for our sins, and the place that we so clearly hear your word proclaimed. Lord, as we gather as church, we pray that we would be a church uh, that is known for being in Christ. We pray that that would be our comfort now as we wait in times that might feel uncertain and life circumstance that changes. We pray that you would hold us in him and that we would rest in the great comfort that you give us, knowing that you promised to build your church and knowing that you promised to gather us to you on that great last day where we will behold your throne as your family. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a song now, and the band's going to lead us in that.
Well, thanks so much, Chris. That, um, I guess that strand that runs through the Bible of temple um, and now us uh, being built into God's temple in the Lord Jesus, there's actually so much depth and richness to that. So th thanks for introducing to that to us and explaining um, how that is such an important mm -hmm. picture of the church right now. Um, there were two things that you kind of brought out that I want to kind of go back to. And one was just the reality of the way that people might question what we've done over the last three months mm. um, in terms of we've been, we've been meeting online. Can you just maybe give us a little bit more kind of thought on what that is? Is that church? Can we actually say that as yeah. church? Yep. Yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because um, we could do online church in a way that I, I think... I'd be way more nervous about calling it church. So yeah. if, if church is like the, the Bible's sort of on the background, we're doing all kinds of vacuuming and other things, we're not really gathering around the word as we would mm. on that last day. Um, but I think if, yeah, the, the church has not always had a building to gather in, mm. um, but it's still been the church. So, yeah, I don't think our gathering uh, in one spot, while it's significant, mm. um, is the, the hallmark of not being a church. Yes. But we certainly are missing out on, on one fundamental expression and, and a really positive one, a blessing, mm. um, by not meeting together. Yeah, yeah. And so there is that just that sense in which I think what you're saying is there is something right about going, this doesn't feel what it should feel like, but that's not that shouldn't actually make us stress whether over the last three months where we've suddenly not been the church because we've been able to gather in different ways around God's word together um, and even though that's not ideal our unity is actually a spiritual unity where the spirit of God lives in us and we're united to Christ that way uh, and so even when we can't actually gather we're still the church um, but you did kind of you did you did kind of then link that to the next thing, which is the restart, and actually that being something um, that is very good to be longing for and mm. wanting. Yeah, can you maybe just talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, I think we we long for it because we long for God. So on that last day when we're standing before Him. Yeah, I, I long for that day as a day where there is no more sin, um, where God wipes every tear from every eye and, and makes all things new. There's a sense where um, gathering together now is the foretaste of yeah. those things. And there's, there's sort of a, a ministerial experience of that stuff now. Um, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not the, um, the beeline to the last day, but, it, but I think you're missing out. If, yes. you're, not, if you're not in this, um, yeah, you're really missing out on one of the things God has given us to make it through this life as yeah. Christians. And I think like thinking about it, one of the ways that I think about it is it's a signpost. It points it's a to that. Word. Yeah, yeah, it points us. So what we do, um, I think what we're doing now, but when we actually gather together physically again, I think there is a signpost, signpost that's pointing to what will, what will it one day be like when we are actually gathered around the Lord Jesus. And therefore, there's something incredibly significant about that and so it's good for us to have mourned the fact that we haven't been able to meet physically mm. um, and to look forward to doing that again it's still not a perfect reality in the sense that we are in a, a time 
you know, we're not in heaven yet. Mm. So when we gather, mm. we still will hurt each other. Mm. Um, there is something different to look forward to on the yeah. last day, but there is some continuity. It's not all discontinuity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's, um, yeah, it, it's good for us to think that way. The last thing, in terms of thinking about temple um, and the church as God's people being built into Christ as the temple, um, what's one thing when we think about that picture of church that when we go back when we restart we we should be thinking about the the big kind of category of what we're actually doing when we do that yeah uh i think we'll be tempted to come back and want to just stick our hands into stuff like get busy doing things Mm. and there's something okay about that like when we look at the great commission jesus says to go and proclaim his name um there's something to do there um, but we do it with the assurance of knowing that he's with us. Mm. Uh, so when we come back together, I'd, I'd want to resist that urge a little bit inside me to want to just stick my hands and get into things and just behold God, mm. just to remember the kind of God that we're gathering before and we're gathering together as we will on that last day. So, yeah, I'd, I'd be wanting to say something like that. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a really, that's a kind of really wonderful way of um, thinking about our gatherings. I think there is just that temptation to think about it's it's about what we do in terms of our our horizontal relationships with one another how we can serve them and there is an important aspect to that and simon's going to talk about that next week great but there's that vertical uh, relationship that we have with god uh, where we can just enjoy being together with him and his people Hmm. And I think that would be a wonderful thing for us to look forward to. It's not, again, it's not that we haven't been doing that over the last three months. I think what we're saying, though, is, is that there is something missing that we look forward to when we return. Hmm. So thanks, Chris. Uh, we look forward to hearing Simon uh, preach on church's body next week. Um, just a couple of things to finish up. If, you were a new, if you're new or visiting us, we would love to get to know you. Uh, we'd love to connect with you. You can write a comment again, either on YouTube or in the uh, online.redlands or online.shorehope pages, or you can find us on Facebook. Uh, if you want to get to speak to somebody, uh, please email admin at redlands.org.au. Uh, we love having you here. Second thing is we have had a new uh, birth in our church, uh, Arthur Kidd. Uh, so this is Ryan and Carly. Um, but um, we're very thankful to God that this little man has arrived. Mum is well, baby is well, and um, so we can give thanks to God for that. Um, they're all doing very well, so congratulations to them. Um, as we do think and talk about relaunching and restarting our services, just want to remind you again of what that's going to involve. Um, we're looking at doing that mid to late July. Uh, I think by next Sunday, we should actually have a date that we can give to you on that. Um, Remember, in terms of how to think about it, how to prepare for it, it's not going back to normal, uh, but looking forward to something new. Uh, I had a friend of mine during the week who said, it's not even a new normal, it might even be a new weird, um, just simply because it's going to be so different. Mm. Um, We uh, really need your help, and we'll get to that in a moment, but I do want to ask you to be continuing to pray and trust God's timing as we prepare for that. Um, Ways in which you can serve, and this is the other element that we'll get to next week in terms of being God's body to one another, ways in which you can serve... um, if you're involved in kids ministry you might have recently received an email to do your your prez safe training to update that if you've received that can i just ask you to 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 do that training uh we need our people to have their training up to date lots of people are up to date but there are those uh, some who haven't could you please um uh, do that so that when we return all our training's been done Second thing is just to remind people and uh, encourage people to join our cleaning crews. This is um, uh, something that we need to do across our congregations, um, but particularly if you're part of the Capella Bar congregations, uh, you can sign up in the link that's in the Friday afternoon bulletin. If you're in Shore Hope or Victoria Point, Russell will be talking to you in the week ahead about, about what's going to happen in that space. Um, there's already been about 30 people signed up to that. And so if you can do that, um, if you've done that, thank you. 
but we'll still need some more people to do it. So um, please do that. Um, last thing is simply uh, we just want to uh, continue to encourage and, and thank you for giving during this season. We continue to ask you to do that uh, using the online giving options that are in the Friday afternoon. Um, that's the end of our service. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again here online next week. See you next time.